All right, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Kalina Duncan, Chief of the Partnerships and Dissemination Branch within the NCI Center for Global Health, and it's great to be with you here today. In 2021, in commemoration of the Center for Global Health's 10th anniversary, we launched this Global Cancer Research and Control Seminar Series. In this series, we feature talks by researchers and cancer control experts working in global oncology and provide opportunities for discussion and collaboration around impactful and innovative work that addresses cancer morbidity and mortality worldwide. In today's session, I am very happy to welcome Dr. Susan Horton and Dr. Shaheen Syed. I'll introduce each with a brief bio and then cover a few logistics before we get started. So welcome, Dr. Horton. Dr. Horton is a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences and a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. She has held faculty appointments at the University of Toronto, Wilfrid Laurier University, and the University of Waterloo in the area of global health economics. Her early work on the economics of nutrition is well known, and she is currently focusing on non-communicable diseases in low and middle income countries and particularly on cancer and diagnostics. She is the deputy co-deputy chair of the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics, which was published in October of 2021. And her work on cancer includes several articles on the cost effectiveness of childhood cancer treatment in low and middle income countries, co-editing the volume on cancer for the disease control priorities series, and a recent paper on the cost effectiveness of multi-cancer early detection. Dr. Horton has worked in more than 20 low and middle income countries and consulted for more than a dozen UN organizations, international development banks, and international research organizations. We are also so pleased to welcome Dr. Shaheen Syed. Dr. Syed is an associate professor and consultant in anatomical pathology and cytology in the Department of Pathology and the current chair and laboratory director of pathology at the Aga Khan University in Nairobi, Kenya. Dr. Syed graduated from the University of Nairobi with a Bachelor of Medicine in Surgery and holds a Master of Medicine in General Pathology from the University of Nairobi where she was awarded the Best Student in Pathology Prize. She is a Fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists and a Fellow of the College of Pathologists of East Central and Southern Africa, or ESCA. Dr. Syed is the Secretary General of the College of Pathologists of ESCA, the Chair of the Academic Committee of the Senate for the ESCA College of Health Sciences, and Chair of the Board of Directors of the African Strategies for Advancing Pathology. Dr. Syed is also a Steering Committee Member and Commissioner for the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics and a member of the Lancet Oncology Commission for Sub-Saharan Africa. Her research interests span oncopathology with a special focus in breast cancer, and she has recently been appointed as a standing member of the WHO Classification of Tumors Editorial Board. Dr. Syed has several grants in peer-reviewed publication and has led research initiatives and interventions that have developed a sustainable model of community-based engagement to improve breast cancer screening and diagnosis. We are so honored to have both guests here with us today. So just a few logistics before we begin. As a note, today's presentation is being recorded and will be available on our website at cancer.gov forward slash global health. You can find information about our future presentations on our website and by following us on Twitter at at NCI Global Health. We know you'll have many questions for our speakers and those will be addressed during the designated question and answer portion which will directly follow their presentations. During that time, you can either use the raise hand function found under the reactions button in Zoom, or you can type your question into the chat box. When called on, please unmute yourself and ask your question. And now I'm very pleased uh, that we will begin our presentation. So welcome, Drs. Horton and Syed. Good morning, uh, and thank you very much for inviting us both to present today. Um, so I'm going to go uh, first for about 20 minutes, and uh, Shaheen will follow for another about 20 minutes. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm very much looking forward to your input. 
So I will focus more on the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics. And I should mention, it was not specifically about cancer diagnostics, but what I will do is draw out some of the implications for cancer. Um, and then Shaheen, who is um, an expert on cancer, will follow with more specific applications to Sub-Saharan Africa. So next slide, please. Um, so what I will do in my short presentation will be to tell you about the seven key messages and 10 recommendations from the Commission and what we are currently engaged in. So since the um, Commission was published in um, October, we've actually been incredibly busy um, doing something like 20 different presentations and workshops uh, globally um, in support of a World Health Assembly resolution. This was one of our key um, recommendations from the Commission, and it's been uh, crazy. I mean, as an academic, I didn't expect to be having to you know, phone up um, chief medical officers and uh, try to lobby ministers of health. But so it's been a very interesting uh, way to see science into policy. Um, yeah, so um, yes, if you want to, uh, further information, um, I provided the link. So you can find the whole report there. There's also an executive summary um, in three, I think at least three different languages, English, French, and Spanish. Um, and there's also a two minute video, um, which we tried to get the impact of our findings to as broad an audience as possible. Next slide, please. So the commission uh, took three years between the first meeting and the publication. Uh, we had two meetings in person and then unexpectedly were interrupted by COVID, uh, like everything else that happened in the last two years. And we concluded the work virtually. So here are some of the commissioners at the first meeting in Oxford. And as you can see, we involved a range of um, experts from different professions. I mean, this was very much a joint effort. Uh, and it, we were really uh, using a systems approach and that required you know, many different professions. So next slide, please. Um, we also had to decide on the scope. Uh, we thought our Commission was quite innovative in that we brought together two disciplines, both very important in diagnostics, um, which typically don't directly work together. Um, so pathology and laboratory medicine and diagnostic imaging. Uh, and you know, since I'm a, an economist and not a diagnostics expert, I was surprised to discover that these two different, uh, different professions have in fact almost different language uh, in one of them uses the term diagnostic tests and one uses the word diagnostic exams. Um, so there was a lot of bridging across disciplines required. Um, also, I was quite surprised to find that uh, diagnostic imaging has a relatively only a recent history of being involved in global health. Um, you know, obviously they work globally, but really focused on, have focused on the technical side of it. Uh, and thinking about the big systems issues, you know, and how they linked to things like universal health coverage was somewhat new. Um, so we also made various restrictions. We looked at under at lack of access to, uh, rather than overuse of diagnostics. I mean, that in itself is a big uh, topic, but we couldn't cover everything. Um, next slide, please. So there are seven key messages. I'm essentially gonna run through them quickly and then devote one slide to say why each of those I think is important. The headline message is that access to diagnostics is uh, unexpectedly poor across the globe. Uh, and this, this is across the global population. And if anything, um, we were generous in thinking about who has access. Anyway, I will define what I mean by access in a second. Uh, we also felt that diagnostics is not well understood. There's a lack of advocacy for diagnostics at the global level, and that's part of the problem. Uh, there, that access, it's uh, inequitable, and that improving access at primary health care is of huge importance. Uh, and the, although the pandemic interrupted us unexpectedly, it also made our findings more relevant and more timely. Next slide, please. 
Uh, technology is very important and there are ways in which technolo recent technologies can improve access. Also, lack of access has really bad impacts. It's a cause of substantial numbers of annual deaths across the globe. Um, and at the same time, any investments in diagnostics yield multiple dollars worth of returns. So it's an excellent investment. So next slide, please. So here's a stark contrast. Here is access to um, HIV diagnostics versus diagnostics that are important for NCDs, particularly cardiovascular disease. So how did we define access? Um, so first, we use WHO's idea that um, healthcare should be within two hours walk of a person where a person lives. Okay, so automatically, a lot of, there are a, a good proportion of the world's population that don't have access to health centers within that walking distance. But it's unreasonable to expect pregnant women in particular who need access to health centers um, to walk more than two hours each way to get care. And secondly, we defined access as the local health center having available a particular test on the day that it was visited by the auditors. Um, so it's no use if the uh, facility uh, has the test available some of the time and then runs out by the end of the month, because if people walk two hours and then find out that they've run out, you know, that's a, an opportunity that's missed. So why is access to um, the infectious disease diagnostics better than for the NCDs? I mean, in part, this relates to the, the uh, Millennium Development Goals. You know, the goal was to deal with HIV, TB and malaria. We had these quite siloed programs which were able to make substantial progress. But unfortunately, they did not build up the whole system for diagnostics. And that's the more difficult goal that's part of universal health coverage. Um, so here, what you can see is blue is bad and red is, sorry, I'm sorry, blue is good and red is bad. So blue means that a large proportion of the population have access to the diagnostics in the way that, we've dis that I've described. Okay, the one thing, one thing I forgot to say is which diagnostics. So there are no guidelines, um, e.g. from WHO, as to what, what diagnostics should be available at primary health care. So what we did is use the WHO recommendations for antenatal care for positive pregnancy, which list eight different diagnostics, including one ultrasound during the pregnancy, um, as important for pregnant women and their babies. And we figured that anything that's really important for pregnant women is of key metabolic importance and should be available for everybody. Okay, so uh, going back to these maps. So this is Malawi um, and you can see most people have access to HIV diagnostics or there are other occasional spots where it's less easy to come by often in more remote regions in the country. But by contrast, glucose, blood glucose strips, you know, a very basic diagnostic, unless you happen to live near to one of the four main uh, referral hospitals in Malawi, uh, you don't essentially have access to glucose strips. Um, you know, and that's very important because without that, pregnant women can't be um, identified who are at risk of uh, pregnancy diabetes and uh, people in the population uh, similarly at risk. And uh, it's an issue because over time, the prevalence of obesity is increasing in many low and middle income countries. Uh, and yet the diagnostics for that are not available. So what's true for glucose is going to be true also for cancer. Uh, so Malawi is, an, is a bit extreme. It's a low income country and access is a little better in the lower middle income countries. And once you get to the upper middle income countries, access tends to improve. Next slide, please. Okay, so universal health coverage uh, is one of the goals from, from the SDGs. So um, there are at least three different outcomes uh, that are important uh, for which diagnostics are important. Diagnostics help to improve the quality of health services and allow monitoring of um, public health and potential pandemics. Um, but as an economist, of course, I focus also on the effect of lack of diagnosis on uh, impoverishment. So 
if people are not diagnosed and not treated, uh, then particularly for working age adults, um, you know, the household can end up spending more to, to treat them for the wrong condition. And if their morbidity, it lasts longer than expected and worst case they die, it could be a financial disaster for households. So diagnosis is also important for, for households' financial security. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, primary healthcare is the last mile. If people cannot reach diagnostics because it's not available in the primary healthcare center, then they will not end up being referred for subsidized healthcare provided under uh, universal health coverage uh, at hospitals and at referral centers. So the only people who will get access are people who, who are rich and can afford private diagnostics um, or who happen to live near to, in big urban centers near to the big hospitals where they can get access for diagnostics. Next slide. I'm sure everybody who is listening has been tested once, if not multiple times for COVID. And so you're fully aware of how important testing is. And it's also shocking to think that the testing rates have declined so much and we are being constantly now warned that we're vulnerable to um, further COVID infections. Next slide. Um, I won't say a lot about uh, recent innovations. It's a huge topic in of itself. Um, and clearly it's super important in cancer. Um, for example, self-sampling um, can is one important way to improve access to diagnostics for cervical cancer that's being developed. Um, and also for cancer, AI can uh, improve access by uh, allowing, um, allowing images to be triaged so that the machines can read images and pick out ones that are unusual and need to be read by a person. And, and that's really important in countries where the um, trained personnel are thin on the ground. Next slide. So here's a calculation that was done using cascade of care data. We, in the commission, we use six tracer conditions. So unfortunately we were not able to include cancer because there are not many um, cascade of care studies for cancer across low and middle income countries, not enough uh, for this purpose. Um, but the, what the cascade study showed is that the gap between, um, uh, between the population and the ability to be diagnosed is the biggest loss in the cascade of care. If only we could get more people diagnosed, even if we can't improve the gap between diagnosis and treatment, um, you know, then uh, that, would, that would, could have a substantial impact on improving um, more, on mortality. Next slide. So again, we're looking at tracer conditions here and I'm using data from three published studies for three of them. And then in the commission, we did the calculations also um, for another three conditions. And what it shows is that the rates of return, you know, the dollar saved or the dollar benefits per dollar spent on diagnostics vary. Um, the biggest returns are for disease, uh, sorry, drug sensitive TB. Um, but you know, there are also substantial returns to the other conditions as well. It varies a little bit in across countries. So for example, um, diagnostic uh, testing for hypertension uh, yields greater benefits in relation to the cost in middle income countries where the prevalence of hypertension is higher um, and lo lower um, benefits in the low income countries. But as the rates of hypertension are increasing globally, obviously the benefits um, of the uh, investments in, um, in diagnostics for diagnosing hypertension are increasing. So next slide. So I didn't do calculations of our own for uh, cancer, but uh, Ward et al published in 2021, um, some very good uh, information for cancer diagnosis um, in a I think in one of the, in one of the Lancet Oncology um, reports. So uh, this slide shows you the impact that scaling up imaging, treatment and quality of care could have. And you can see that imaging is accounting for almost half of the benefits in terms of um, both reducing cancer deaths and improving 
the returns to investments. Next slide. So here are our recommendations at the national level. None of these are going to be hugely surprising to you. Uh, and many of them are conditional on resources. You know, for example, uh, committing to regulatory frameworks is something uh, that there's been a lot of discussion about and trying to get regional, more regional harmonization to make it easier uh, to have a, a, an appropriate framework for diagnostics. Um, next slide, please. Um, at the international level, again, I, I think none of these are hugely surprising. If you look at what's been done in the arena for pharmaceuticals, many of the same things are required for diagnostics. Um, just as a useful benchmark, um, the world diagnostics market is about a tenth the size of the world pharmaceutical market. And perhaps that's one reason that diagnostics have attracted less attention. But still, it's a lot of billions of dollars. Um, so what we have done since the commission was published is to take what we felt was the first step to try and increase recognition for diagnostics, which in turn will affect funding. And that's why we're pursuing um, this option of a WHA resolution. Um, and we would, we would very much hope that following on from that, there will be an international diagnostics alliance set up uh, to help take this forward. Next slide, please. So, why did we think about a WHA resolution? Uh, we were advised to do this by the surgeons who had done a global surgery um, uh, series, sorry, a commission uh, with The Lancet also, and they felt this was a high impact way uh, to make progress, to um, attract attention. I mean, it's only a first step. A WHA resolution needs then to be put into practice by international partners and by national governments. But what our commission did hopefully was to establish a baseline uh, for which measurements could be made in the future and so progress could be tracked. So next slide. So I was never trained in grad school about um, how to go about doing a WHA resolution. So it's been a really interesting process. Um, what happens is that if the resolution is passed, uh, both the WHO and the countries undertake to follow up with various steps and to then report on progress after two or three years. And we hope that the, pro the process of um, trying to get a resolution can get some of the stakeholders together. We were quite surprised that the um, diagnostics manufacturers are not a group that meet together or interact together, and they certainly don't interact with civil society, with patients in a very organized way. And that's different from what happens in pharmaceuticals, um, where there is a, there's a fair price forum. Um, and there's been a lot of negotiations about improving access by reducing prices. So next slide. Um, so the, there's a, a long process for developing a resolution. Uh, basically, you have to get a group of countries to support an initial letter that goes to the executive board in November of the WHO, or sorry, in October. And then the executive board discusses this in January and other stakeholders, um, and typically the non-state entities with, um, with standing uh, with, with WHO are allowed to comment. And then if it passes the executive board, it appears on the WHO agenda in May. Next slide, please. So it's been a big process. Uh, we have made all kinds of presentations and all kinds of fora. Um, I'm willing to bet that most of you in the audience, inc including myself prior to doing this, would have never been able to decipher this alphabet spaghetti of uh, the academic conferences. The reason is it spans everything. It spans from cancer conference, laboratory medicine conferences, international health, infectious disease, radiology conferences. Uh, UICC was very important. Um, so diagnostics cut across the health system. Um, so it's been a big project. Next slide. Uh, and there are a whole group of stakeholders you have to engage, the non-state entities with official relations with WHO, the big international organizations, you know, such as the multilateral development banks that fund many activities in health, professional associations within countries, 
and then industry also who produce pharmaceuticals. Next slide, please. So uh, some thoughts. I've learned a lot since October. Um, firstly, I, I had probably had this naive view that we were going to set up something like Gavi, which was for immunizations, the Global um, Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations. But no, that's not what we're going to do in the end. Um, diagnostics is a backbone of the health system. And by setting up another vertical, we are not going to help things. What we've had to do is to reach out to many, many different groups, uh, you know, surgeons, um, the private sector who produce diagnostics, patient organizations, and to try and get the message across to them. And that's not that's complicated by the fact that within di diagnostics, there are many different smaller professions and people tend to identify with their own specific set of technical skills. And it's not been actually easy to get the professional organizations to respond to us. I feel like a cold caller uh, or a marketer must feel, you know, for every 10 calls we make, you know, we find a couple of people who really get what we are uh, trying to explain to them. Uh, and then a whole number who are very busy and don't even respond. And you would think it's win-win, but for professional associations, you know, they should immediately get the idea that uh, we need to have more funding, and more advocacy and more visibility for um, diagnostics. But um, my ex our experience is that they have many of their own um, things that they're concerned about. Many are really concerned about what they can do on the ground level the education of pro the professionals locally. Um, so uh, that was a surprise to me. Um, and we also have found uh, a lot of resonance amongst the NCD groups, you know, who immediately understand because they themselves know the lack of diagnostics and treatment that's available and, you know, the financial problems that people in low-income countries face who are diagnosed um, with one of the major NCDs. Um, we're currently reaching out to the um, maternal health. Uh, so RMNCAA stands for Reproductive Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health. And that's a group that also uh, seems to be getting, getting the message. And we plan to work on the rare diseases and reach out to them next. Okay, I think we're close to the end. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, how does this apply to cancer? So cancer is unusual in that it's more of the resources for diagnosis and treatment tend to be located at referral hospitals. And that's especially true in low and middle income countries. In it, whereas in high income countries, we have the resources to decentralize imaging and diagnostics, you know, like mammography, um, at least to the first level hospitals, which is not the case in the low and middle income countries currently. But that has to change. We have to be able to decentralize um, screening and diagnosis of um, NCDs to lower levels in the health system. Otherwise, poor people simply cannot afford to travel to the capital city for diagnosis and treatment. Um, we may not have diagnosis at the primary health care level, but we should be thinking about can we do opportunistic screening and then refer people at least to the first level hospitals. Next slide, please. Okay, and at the first level hospitals, we do need the resources to provide, to decentralize treatment also. And it requires very basic diagnostics. Um, blood chemistry uh, is needed um, in order to support hormone therapy um, and uh, blood matching, a uh, cross match is needed if you have to do surgery or emergency surgery for people with cancer. Um, and imaging is a particular lack. Uh, ultrasound was just starting to come in in the primary health centers um, when, as we were writing the commission, um, but still not very much available. First level hospitals may have x-ray, but quite often it's not working. Um, and uh, the good news, I want to end up with some good news, is that new technologies may help to make things better. Point of care, ultrasound, dual energy x-ray. So next slide, please. And with that, thank you. And I'm going to pass this over to Shaheen.
Um, thank you. Um, hmm. Um, so can you hear me? Thank you very much, um, Sue, for setting the stage. I hope you can hear me. Um, you can hear you can just fine, Shahi. Okay, yes. super. Yep, loud and clear. I, I, I may have switched off my video. My um, network is a bit unstable. But um, so thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I'll try and keep time um, so that we have a bit of time for some questions. Um, so my uh, talk today is about diagnostics for breast cancer in East Africa, but I will um, focus uh, primarily um, uh, to Kenya. However, a lot of these activities are East Africa wide. Um, and I will, um, so the uh, presentation outline is why breast cancer, why are we talking about breast cancer? And what are the diagnostic gaps as far as breast cancer is concerned? And just touch briefly on the essential diagnostic list uh, by WHO um, and some bits about the recommendations for, from the Lancet Commission report and why um, we think that you know, breast cancer is a, you know, a good example to see how um, uh, some of those recommendations um, can be aligned with breast cancer diagnostics. And then a couple of slides on the um, uh, tiered laboratory system. So uh, in terms of why breast cancer, as we can see here, this is published uh, just recently in the Lancet Oncology. Uh, we very well see that when we look at sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, the, the overall um, uh, cancer burden, whether it's the incidence and the mortality, we can see that in the next two decades, um, this will likely double uh, and it's going to be doubling uh, both as far as the um, incidence and the mortality is concerned. And if you look at the East African region, it seems and it's apparent uh, that it's quite high, the cancer incidence and mortality um, in, from East Africa. Um, when you look at the global statistics, uh, which are the uh, region specific incidence and mortality, um, uh, you see that again, um, age standardized rates per 100,000, um, comparing, uh, for example, Northern Europe uh, with Eastern Africa, even though the incidence is lower, the mortality is disproportionately higher um, in East Africa. What about Kenya? Uh, as you can see here, Kenya in Kenya, breast cancer forms about a quarter of the cases that were reported or estimated by Globocon 2020 uh, that were published, uh, uh, estimates published by Globocon 2020, 25% of all of our um, cancers uh, in women are actually um, uh, uh, breast cancer. In terms of the um, actual scenario um, is that it is the most commonly diagnosed cancer as we have said, uh, it affects a predominantly younger population. Women, as you can see in that very miserable looking uh, illustration on your right, uh, women uh, present with advanced stage of diagnosis and there is a higher incidence mortality uh, ratio and we do not currently have any national um, screening program uh, for breast uh, cancer screening. And this, begs to mind whether African women inherently are predisposed to more aggressive disease or are there additional, uh, for example, non-biologic uh, factors that may be contributing um, to women presenting so late. And this could, you know, and perhaps access uh, or to um, diagnostics or limited diagnostic capabilities that may also not be reliable could account for why women uh, present um, so late by the time they're coming for treatment. 
In terms of the role of the laboratory or the pathology um, uh, pathologists, how you know what, what is it that diagnostics um, involves when it comes to tissue diagnosis for breast cancer? We know that it's very very important because. Uh, one is able to determine the biologic type, um, provide uh, the stage, uh, and the biologic type is dependent upon some of the biomarkers that we are uh, routinely tested in breast cancer, which is the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and the um, HER2 receptor, um, uh, uh, HER2 or receptor. And then that also, um, the response to therapy uh, is where as well the pathologist comes in. Uh, so not only for prediction, but for prognostication as well. And that's where diagnostics is key um, in breast cancer. In terms of the classification, we know that breast cancer is a disease, is um, heterogeneous, many um, intrinsic types, um, and, and, and these have been uh, determined on protein expression, mRNA levels and DNA um, changes, and four main groups um, that uh, we routinely identify, again, based on estrogen receptor and HER2. And so the question then begs, why is it imp important um, uh, to determine these biomarkers in breast cancer? Because as we have uh, alluded to before, it identifies the uh, biologic type, but also more importantly, identifies the type of treatment most likely to benefit um, uh, the patient. And if this um, uh, biomarker estimation is inaccurate, uh, there is uh, the potential loss of five to 10 years of life-saving um, therapies because the patient will not have access to these therapies. So therefore, accurate testing um, is very, very important and false negatives and false positives have been um, cited severally um, from many studies um, specifically coming from this part of the world. So when we look at the survival data, um, for ER positive uh, breast cancers, generally they do have a better prognosis stage for stage than those um, that are ER negative um, uh, for the, at least for the first um, uh, 15 years. Um, for ER negatives, um, they would either occur early, the recurrences would occur early, or they would uh, occur much late. Um, and when we look at the kind of data that's been published, uh, for example, for Kenya and Uganda and compare that with the US, we find that each population group uh, may have different frequencies of breast cancer types. It's possible that, uh, you know, when we, when we look at the data for Uganda, for example, the, 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 you know, the bad um, or the worst prognosticate you know, the worst um, type of breast cancer, which is the ER negative breast cancer, the proportions that have been published from Uganda, which neighbors Kenya, is 57%. And when you look at Kenya, it's about 28, which is similar to um, that that has been reported from um, the state. So that begs, you know, the question is, are these really biologic differences or are there um, issues with the diagnostics um, when it comes to uh, receptor status um, uh, analysis? And then this is a study um, uh, you know, that was published a few years back that clearly shows that for women diagnosed with breast cancer in the US, um, the, the, the women who are born in West Africa but reside in the US um, and, and, and those who are West African in origin have similar um, you know, proportions of ER negative cancer, whereas women born in East Africa have an incidence more similar to women of European descent. So again, the question you know, is that there must be, other than you know, lack of diagnostics and uh, stage at presentation, there must be some other biologic factors um, that, that could explain uh, why the differences. And so this is just a, an illustration of what a typical American family looks like, you know, very uh, mixed um, um, sort of heritage compared 
to the indigenous populations um, uh, who are, you know, who have been born and live in um, sub-Saharan Africa in this part of the world. So, um, like we mentioned, that there are no published data uh, describing the clinical and pathologic characteristics, and so one of our studies um, that, that was published, uh, we decided to look at whether uh, where there are some ethnic differences when it comes to um, ER negative uh, breast cancer or the triple negative, where which are ER, PR, and her two negative breast cancers, and if there are any ethnic differences. And we, you know, looked at about eleven hospitals. We included about eleven hospitals uh, throughout Kenya. We had about eight hundred and forty-six cases. Um, and what we found is that when we compared the two major ethnic groups, um, uh, one of the ethnic groups, which are the Bantus, um, even though we didn't find uh, much in terms of differences in the biologic subtypes, uh, the uh, Bantus had uh, were more educated, more uh, so the risk factors uh, for breast cancer like um, a high BMI, uh, age. Uh, we found that there were differences um, in, 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 um, in some of these risk factors uh, like age and BMI and um, age at first birth and age of menopause. Um, and so even though there were no uh, differences in these uh, molecular subtypes, however, what we did find, even though it was not statistically significant, that one of the, the Bantu or the Delilots were more somehow more likely um, to have um, a HER2, which is a more aggressive type of breast cancer. So they tended to have uh, a higher um, uh, proportion of um, HER2 enriched or the, you know, the, the more aggressive kind of breast cancer compared to the other ethnic groups. Um, and then uh, we have uh, again uh, shown that uh, we took a small number of our triple negative breast cancers, about 15, and compared them uh, in collaboration with the uh, uh, University of Birmingham, Alabama, with Caucasians and African Americans. And we found that there were some you know, molecular signatures that were like specific or unique rather to the Kenyan triple negative breast cancers. And so we are hoping then to, to be able to identify and to validate these findings, uh, you know, using um, um, uh, more um, additional molecular techniques and immunohistochemistry and see if really um, uh, using a larger cohort, whether these findings really play out in terms of the uniqueness of the breast cancers that we see. So why are we talking about all this? Just to, just to um, sort of stress on the importance of diagnostics, just to stress on the importance of why it's important to have accurate diagnosis, to be able to determine, you know, um, not only the receptors, but as well uh, for downstream applications, for treatment decisions, uh, for breast cancers, which is uh, the most common and the most prevalent cancer um, currently in this part of the world in females. So what are some of the gaps that we have identified and the improvement efforts in a breast cancer diagnosis? Um, so this was a study that was published um, uh, in 2018 by Brand et al. Uh, again, from um, um, looking at the and examining the gaps in the public health sector in Kenya with reference specifically to histology and cytology services. A total of about um, 11 hospitals um, come out of the 13 or so completed the survey. And these were high, you know, hospitals that were county referrals or so tier four, tier five hospitals. And um, you know, we can see here that when we look at the gap in pathologist staffing, only about half, just over slightly half of them uh, were manned by pathologists, only about half of them were able to perform histology. And these are, you know, referral um, hospitals, uh, which have, uh, you know, a surgical um, a staff component. So they would be 
you know, doing their mastectomies and, 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 and be able to do biopsies at that level. Um, so you can see that it is uh, unfortunate that it's only about half of them which have the capacity um, um, to perform. And only about, you know, 80 or percent of these hospitals uh, maintain the register of diagnosed cancer cases. Um, only one had an electronic um, uh, recording system or health system. And uh, in terms of immunohistochemistry, um, uh, these were none of these centers had the setup to do this ERPR in her to on site. But of those that referred or outsourced these to private facilities, only about 50% of those cases uh, were referred out. Uh, so you can see that a huge proportion, there's a huge gap, and there's a huge proportion of women uh, who have breast cancer, but are not routinely um, having their uh, receptor status um, uh, determined. And in terms of, as well, it's not just doing the receptors, it's what about how um, is you know, the specimen being handled prior to when it comes to the laboratory and find that there are gaps as well in there. Um, this was a paper we published that shows how um, you know, a poorly handled specimens um, can, you know, uh, A and B, um, you can see that the receptor status is totally negative because the tumor on the left upper panel is very poorly preserved. And on the same patient, uh, a lymph node was submitted. And you can clearly see when we repeat, when we repeated um, the, the, the ER on that particular lymph node, it turned out that it is diffusely positive and the tumor is diffusely positive. So that again demonstrates um, the gaps uh, when it comes to breast cancer diagnostics. It's not just what happens in the lab, but it's what also um, the, we must pay attention to what happens outside the lab, you know, at the time um, the, the, the uh, procedure for um, whether it's a lumpectomy um, or a mastectomy is being performed in theater. Um, and, and, and it's also important, it's not just important for determining the uh, receptor status for those cancers, but as well grading and um, uh, determining other prognostic um, uh, features that can be observed at the level of microscopy. And we know very well, as this uh, paper elegantly demonstrates whether it's with or without treatment grade in itself, which is a histomorphological assessment, is a key component or is a key or an independent prognostic uh, factor. And that is again impacted by poor handling of these specimens. And these are what we talk about the pre-analytic phase that is before the specimen comes into the labs, you know, the, the collection, how it's transported, um, whether the, all the information that is required to be on that um, requisition is um, actually submitted. And these are the four elements and that, you know, are um, the guidelines by the ASCO cap, um, the ischemia time, the time in formalin, the kind of uh, fixative that we use. And um, this was a study that was conducted here by our, um, our resident here uh, and looking at how, uh, whether we could do a quality, you know, before and after study, looking at these pre-analytic variables in breast cancer handling and conducted two workshops, got, you know, the surgeons, the, you know, theater staff involved from two um, hospitals uh, within the outskirts of Nairobi, tried to introduce a checklist that was kept compliant and trying to see if we can monitor pre and post and whether this raising awareness really helps. And you can see, um, sorry, and you can see that even though um, uh, uh, there is not 100% uh, um, improvement, there was some improvement by just raising this awareness among uh, the surgeons and the, um, and, 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 and the theater staff and people who transport uh, specimens to and from theater to the lab. 
And this is just an example of one of the doctors who post workshop, you can see, has completed quite a number of very important elements that will be, um, uh, that will impact the downstream examination of that specimen where you're having the, 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 uh, the, the markings of the, uh, the, the, the specimen itself, you have the, um, uh, the specimen collection time, when it was excised, when it was placed in formalin, there are some gaps, of course, but this is um, uh, this work in progress. And this was again um, presented by this particular resident at the Surgical Society of Kenya scientific uh, meeting. And this is how um, we think that, you know, the Lancet Commission uh, report the recommendation that we need to have advocacy, not only among the pathologists and maybe uh, the laboratory technologists, but as well, the um, important to have this among. Um... Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, among uh, the surgeons and um, as well, and and then the WHO. Why it's important for advocacy um, as well is because um, and and through this advocacy, international advocacy, we the third um, WHO essential diagnostic list actually now includes. Uh, estrogen receptor and HER2 receptor estimation uh, in breast cancer as a, uh, you know, an essential diagnostic test uh, for every laboratory that has histopathology capacity to do it. And then in terms of point of care tests, and I think I really, um, the time is not on my side, but I don't want to take too much of time, but just to show you some of the efforts um, we're using, for example, the gene expert. It's an equipment we use for diagnosing TB. We try. We have recently sort of va done a validation study of how we can use that that you know cartridges, point of care cartridges, to be able to run PR, PR, and HER2. Pretty good um, accuracies. However, there is room for improvement, and hope we are hoping to do further studies. We are also looking into doing um, accuracy of nanosensor based breast cancer diagnosis at point of care. And then some of the um, collaborative efforts and outcomes that are important to improve diagnostics, including partnering, including partnering with industry. And you can see, especially in Kenya and to somewhat in Tanzania as well, we've partnered with industry to be able to A, train, to be able to, um, the, you know, optimize um, cancer specimen handling, so guideline development, um, quality improvements, um, uh, increasing access to immunohistochemistry um, testing in public institutions. 2,500 patients have already benefited and as well as precision medicine, for example, having training and building capacity for immuno, um, um, uh, immunotherapy um, testing for PDL1, for example, um, uh, surgical outcomes as well, training surgeons, um, having uh, multidisciplinary, organizing multidisciplinary teams, um, partnering with 17 county governments to promote screening and linkage to care and making sure that there is access. And in terms of the um, in terms of the hub and spoke model, uh, being able to see how uh, what is um, being currently um, piloted for HIV, TB, and malaria in terms of the hub and spoke model can actually work for cancer, and can actually work for the Kenyan health system structure. Uh, that, if, for example, for in for NCDs like breast cancer, where you have at each level some sort of test and then, then at the highest level you have the immunohistochemistry and histology testing. So thank you very much. I do apologize for taking longer than I had anticipated. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much Dr. Syed and Dr. Horton for the wonderful presentations. Uh, that was a terrific overview of global diagnostics and diagnostics for breast cancer in the East Africa region and just how training and quality improvement partnership and we as global oncology actors can play a role in transforming access. Um, really inspiring. We'll open for questions and we have about five minutes. Um, and if you would like to, to turn your cameras on, 
um, or raise your hands, um, or you can also put your questions in the chat, um, but would love to, to take questions from the audience. Chris, I see you unmuted and came on camera. Do you have a quick question? I do have a quick question. Thank you so much to the two presenters for highlighting all these super important issues. And I know that you would definitely appreciate um, sort of community-based approaches that would augment the things you're talking about, particularly in providing education about the importance of screening, what it can accomplish, and raising awareness that one, you know, although one fears cancer, one not need fear this process, and that in fact the benefits of screening for cancer can lead to survival, can lead to positive outcomes for communities, but, but one must counter so much misconception, so much fear about discovering this dreadful thing in the body and you know, wanting to leave well enough alone, those, those sorts of attitudes are out there. How do you view sort of community approaches as complementing the kinds of system level things uh, that you've largely focused on? Uh, maybe, go ahead, you go ahead Shane. Okay, so I think it's very, it has to go hand in hand. You cannot divorce um, the community from what we are trying to achieve, you know, at the highest um, tier level of the health system. And it has to be integrated in such a way. Um, and, and, and the more important bit, and we have done some community work in the coastal region of Kenya in some parts of Western Kenya, and we have realized that a lot of it has to do other than the cultural beliefs and the misconceptions and you know the the, the um re, you know the the uh, fear that there is no support perhaps from the community and more importantly from the health um, care system is the fact that a lot of the medical or the healthcare providers themselves are ignorant of you know, um, the, 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 the sort of messaging uh, that needs to go out to the community. So I think our target needs to be multi-pronged. It's not just the leaders within the community or the community health workers, but more importantly, uh, the healthcare providers themselves who need to be educated. And then from then on, I think things become much easier. The referral system then would work, your system would work. Um, if the healthcare providers themselves uh, had a good understanding. And if, if I can add a couple of words, I mean, that's a great question. Um, in cancer, the role of patient uh, advocates, you know, who, survivors and their families has been tremendously important. Uh, and I was quite struck when we also looked at other NCDs um, that it's been a much stronger role within the cancer and it's very effective. I mean, the parents of pediatric cancer patients who've advocated for, you know, support like providing hostels and providing, um, you know, uh, support for their transport, you know, has a huge impact on adherence to treatment. Um, but, and it's not just the, the, uh, the, the survivors themselves, but also the system has to help support them. We had a very effective um, cancer, uh, cancer advocate on the commission who added a huge amount to it. And she had benefited from training. The US had provided some funding to various of the Latin American patient groups to sort of educate uh, them how to play a role effectively in these kinds of discussions. And when we looked at some of the other NCDs, like in diabetes and cardiovascular, um, they don't have the same involvement of patient organizations. I mean, it's difficult uh, to reach out to these groups. You know, there are many of them, they're quite disparate, but they're a huge part, an important part of the community. Thanks. Thanks, Chris, for that great question. Um, we're about at time, but I'll open it up to see if there is one more question. Um, just wanna give, someone else an opportunity, feel free to unmute yourself um, and, and come on camera if you do have one. Okay, wonderful. Well, oh, Fira, okay. I was gonna, I was gonna take the last question for myself, but happy to give it to you. Please go ahead. To unmute. You, you're muted, Fira. Oh, she can't unmute herself, I believe. There, yeah. There we go. 
<laughs> Sorry, and, and taking a little extra time. I was just waiting to see if anyone else had a question. Um, for both of you, I mean, it's remarkable work. It's incredibly impactful. And as somebody who's also uh, helping put together a leading and Lancet Commission, how do you take the recommendations to the policy arena? What are the, what's the magic, uh, what's the word, the magic potion that led you to develop a World Health Assembly resolution <laughs> in 25 words or less? Thanks. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe I'll start and she can yes. add. So we were, it was one of our commissioners, so John Mira from the Surgery Commission who, uh, you know, got us started on this road. And then I have to say UICC was tremendously helpful because they themselves have also shepherded through um, uh, cancer um, uh, resolutions. And so they helped us a lot with the process. So I think that's my advice. You have to talk to people who've done it before because you've not been trained to do this. Well, I hadn't been <laughs> and probably you know, the, there's a lot to learn in this process. And also you have to expect that it's really time consuming and involves you reaching out to lots and lots of different people that you would never have expected. So more power to you. Yes, I agree. And I think it's important to like dialogue with ministries of health, the people who matter, the people who make the decisions. I think it's important to be able to sit on the same table. Um, I think that helps because then people listen. Wonderful, thank you so much. I'm sorry we don't have time for more questions. It would be lovely to talk a little bit more about um, some of the very important health systems strengthening and health systems aspects around this, as well as this important um, aspect of partnership and community. But this has been fantastic and thank you both again. Um, I know you are getting on to a, a session with the fellows. So let me conclude our, our session for today. Um, a note that our seminar series at the Center for Global Health will be taking a summer break uh, in July and August, and we will resume in September. So you can uh, continue to stay tuned um, to our website. Again, that's cancer.gov forward slash global health um, or our, our Twitter account at NCI Global Health for more information on funding opportunities, events like these, uh, past recorded sessions, um, and lots of other good information. So thank you everyone. This was a fantastic turnout and a fantastic discussion and have a really wonderful day. And thank you again, Sue and Shaheen. Thank you, bye. Bye everyone. Thanks for inviting us. U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Institutes of Health, National Cancer Institute, cancer.gov, 1-800-4-CANCER.